speaking, if you can just shut it off. Okay, go ahead, Jeff. Hi, I'm Jeff Thomas with First Nation of Cable. Um, we're in the middle of uh, working on the UBF grant and uh, Hang on a second. We'll just make sure we get the so the community and everybody can hear you. I'm not sure what's wrong with that one. She had issues with it yesterday too. It's not working. She said it was unhooked. I don't know where this goes. <laughs> <laughs> It's not going to work out. It's official. It's official. Share. Yeah. So if you guys can just, sorry, just, just use the one, one mic <laughs> and just to talk into it. Thank you. Okay. Um, like I said earlier, um, I'm Jeff Thomas. I'm with First Nations Cable. Um, we're currently working with the UBF grant uh, to run fiber to every household here on the reserve. Now, we've been working since, so I'll... It's been over a year now, um, but uh, actually physically working out there where we're putting in fiber and uh, conduit, it's been since June of last year. Now we have completed our uh, backbone build, which was our link to uh, Hydro One substation in the back, uh, in the rear of uh, Middleport. So that was a 22 kilometer build that we got and it's up and running and it's feeding the community now. It's working very well, um, night and day compared to what we had before. Okay, um, I took the liberty of inviting um, Solo Cable in. There are contractors. I think it's time to put some faces to who you uh, see out in the community and that type of thing. So we had some there were some concerns that came in from uh, some of the property owners, um, mainly due to us drilling and what what's happening. Obviously, it's uh, wet out. We create some ruts, so on and so forth. Uh, what we're here to, today is to try and uh, put this forth of uh, what the procedure is going to be. Uh, we've been working with Nathan, and we've been working with Michael from. Uh, Public Works. We're trying to um, address some of the social media that um, where uh, we can uh, get more information out to the out to uh, the property owners, and the community community members. So um, th today, what we want to talk about is that that portion of it, and also we have a construction schedule that we want to put forth. Um, I know Nathan had talked about uh, allowing us to access your your apps and uh, your website in order to put this information up. We're doing the same thing with ours and uh, all the direct contacts. If there's an issue, a customer or a potential customer or band member is concerned about uh, some of the damages that happen. Uh, obviously, we can't get at them and do anything about it till it dries up in the spring. So probably looking at probably late spring. But we're here to make sure that everybody understands uh, that property will be put restored fully back to what the original state was. I think we've had about five complaints, which isn't too bad. We got about 45 kilometers of uh, conduit in the ground now. So um we've had some people say we should be calling everybody which is virtually impossible um now with void phones and cell phones we don't have numbers for everybody it's it's virtually impossible so what we're trying to do is find that medium where we can get the information out to the band members and let everybody know these guys aren't you know they're not from the community they're out here working their butts off, trying to get this project done. And uh, we kind of got to get that medium, you know, where um, 
they're being respected and also the community properties being respected. So those are the things that we want to talk about tonight. I'll turn it over to Troy. He can introduce himself and then. So I'm, I'm Troy Sider from Solar speak, Cable Solutions. Can you speak in, right? Can you bring the mic? Yeah. Thank you. So I'm Troy Sider from Solo Cable Solutions. We're located in Brantford. Um, we are, we're the ones contracted with Jeffrey. I think we started working together 2018 or 19 on an outage yes. and been working since then and kind of partnered up with this. Um, we do have other companies that you might see beside just Solo. There'll be Ram Key and Groundhog out com completing this work. It is our companies. It's just a different name and different divisions that we do, but it is solely under us. We did put together on the engineering side a basic, and maybe Erm can hand a few out that shows the reserve and how we're setting a schedule to completed in a, a succession as, as much as we can. So we do have a schedule together. We stick to that schedule as close to what we can, but it is dependent on, again, weather and locates and... We got more? So basically how we've gone about the schedule, because the reserve is broken down in real nice blocks, um, we're, we're trying to go systematically road by road and build out as we go. Um, I think the first section that we started was first line in Mohawk. It was later in the fall, which worked out nice. I think the restoration went well, but as we got closer into the winter months and now, there are a, a lot more issues with being able to restore as we go. We're trying to not spread ourselves all over the place, but try to go systematically. So if we could potentially get this, whether it's on your webpage or Jeffrey's or both, people could see where, where we're working and what we're doing. We're trying to get road by road as quickly as possible and minimizing the impact on customers, on, on the residents. We've done a lot of these builds across uh, Southwestern Ontario to date. And a few things we've done to minimize the impact, first of all, is being as systematic as we can. Putting out, we have um, email addresses and obviously our phone numbers that you can post on your websites and stuff so that any complaints the residents have, they can either go directly to us or you people all have our immediate contact. I know with the, I think it's been about five complaints. Yeah. We always have a supervisor on site and our health and safety coordinator. It's typically less than two hours when we respond to that customer. A lot of times it's within the hour. Um, once we get the complaint, then we can speak with the customer. The issue being is the equipment we use is very heavy. And when it's wet and we're, we're going to create ruts and damage on lawns, typically it's a public right away, but you're still, people still maintain that a lot right up to the ditch line. So they, it does get upsetting at times. Typically what we do is we try to restore as fast as we're doing it within a week or two. But this time of year, it, it it is a tough a tough go, and we got to wait till not only the weather gets better that you can put the grass seed and topsoil down, but we'll have to circle back around in the spring, early, earliest spring as we can, to go through all the sections we've built. So we'll have a a crew dedicated to not only the sections we're working on at that point, but in the spring when it's dry enough. We'll have crews now going through all the completions we've done to make sure they're up up to par. Um, I think that will help with in the community to see that it is getting restored as quickly as possible. Um, we do we figure 
our goal is to have another up to 60 kilometers done by the end of May. So we're trying to be as aggressive as we can. Not, and, and it is a tax on obviously the public roads and everything because of the locates we're putting in, GTEL, Six Nations Gas. There's a lot of locates going in. So we're trying to be as systematic and as fast as we can, not having to have these locates go out and re relocating, having now public works have to go out and relocate. We're trying to minimize that. So that's why the we're dedicated to try to get the speed that we're doing without with a minimum impact to the community. So we're open to any suggestions that you would like us to provide, whether um, we are putting up signage now. Mm -hmm. So Jeffrey's just trying to get approval from the government for where we're going to place or where, what the signage is going to look like. Yeah, it's a project. Um, the government has requested us. Post Can you just speak into the mic? Sorry. Thank yeah. you. The government has requested that we post uh, the project in a community area. They be along the road somewhere, just basically stating how much money that they're putting in and um, that it's part of the grant program. So both Ontario and the feds are both requested that. So Our crews will be putting signage up to in the areas we're working, stating that it's for First Nations cable and, and it's the fiber built for that. So it does list name us and Jeffrey so that people could call hopefully instead of always calling and complaining to outside. So that's the other side that uh, what has to be kept in mind is this project has to be done by December 31st to th or 2025. So we have roughly two years to complete and that means everybody on a reserve to have it up and running and active and you know so there is a a schedule that's got to be kept in order to meet that date okay thank you um i have a question audrey hi jeff welcome on uh, your your uh, group uh, my question is on that map that you showed us is um, how do you read it? So are you starting with the red and you're going all the way around the outside of the reserve? Are you doing different colors in the middle? What is your approach? So my name is Ermius. I'm a lead designer for Solo Cable. Um, in this layout, I've shown where our uh, completed construction areas are. So you can see along fifth line, we've completed that whole section highlighted in green. Um, a couple areas on Seneca between 4th and 5th, as well as 6th line west of Chiefs Wood. So anything in green on this map displays anything that we've completed the construction on. Um, legend is shown on the top left where you can see where everything is marked out. I've also shown where we um, propose to have completed by the first quarter of 2024. So anything in pink, what you see along the west end of Chiefs Wood, so along Seneca and west of that, so on fourth line, third line, and second line, we'd like to have completed, as well as working towards uh, completing fourth line east of Chiefswood, all the way to the railway. Um, so on the map, we have that highlighted. Um, eventually our goal is in December of 2025 to have everything completed, every road along the, uh, within the reserve in the community completed, so. Could I have a follow-up to Chief? Yes, go ahead. So once you get it completed, is that when the system uh, goes on or as you uh, build it, are they, you able to use the fiber for the homeowner? What we're doing, Audrey, is we are, um, these guys are burying the conduit. Solo's burying the conduit. And then we're coming in behind them, putting the fiber in the ground or into the conduit. And then we're plowing service wires in and our guys will be activating it as it goes. So probably two to three months after they've already gone through, then we'll be activating the services behind. So we hope to be turning customers on within a couple months of these guys going through, so. 
And now we're just waiting on equipment. We hope to have our first customer up in Mohawk done probably uh, mid February. We'll be up. Okay, no. Hazel, then Dale. Yes, I just want to ask because there are so many um, um, underground, I don't know what the proper name is, so many things buried there to accommodate uh, water and gas and all of that. Is there like a, a underground roadmap for you and everybody else to know where all of these things are? Like, how can you tell? Because I know they do have the metal detectors, but um, how is that sorted out so everybody kind of knows where their area is? Thanks. We go through an Ontario One call to put in locates for services such as uh, Bell and Hydro. And then we go through Public Works to get the water and if there's any sewers or any any public utilities and then six nations gas does their own locates we send them the locates also and then jeffrey also lays it out so they give us a a map i guess the easiest way to explain it of everything that's in the ground and so from there we have to cite all the utilities we're crossing or coming within a meter and that's how we know what's in the ground. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. But a little deeper in that, we, uh, Nathan and uh, Michael from Public Works, we've we had a meeting not too long ago, and uh, we talked about, I think two, two important things. Number one is uh, we're talking about setting up a utility board. A utility board is crucial for what we do. Basically, what happens and and what the U utility board will do is kind of gear up and start setting easements, easements for each one of the utilities, and then the other side of it is all the projects that are new and coming in. Everybody gets a chance to try and do what we call common trenching. Um, that common trenching is uh, where we utilize that trench that's being dug and we can put two or three of the utilities into that. Gas is always going to be separate. Water will always be separate. But the uh, hydro and bell and uh, the cable could go in the same trench. All we do is separate it by depth. Um, Dale, then Carrie. Yeah, I had a question about your map, but I think you answered that for for Audrey because it just so you had green and purple, so I think that or pink, I think so that's been answered. I guess my question is in regards to I guess process for the community members. Like, is there a handout? Is there forms that they got to fill out? Uh, is that coming or? Yeah, there is a form, and it's been on our website since we started. Um, there's a number of uh, different forms on there, um, whether you need a locate, whether you need, uh, you know, you got a concern, whether you got, uh, you want to sign up. Obviously, when it gets around to us putting uh, um, service wires in, we're going to have to get permission to go onto the property. And um, we've been dropping off flyers in the mailboxes. Uh, we're trying to make it as public as we can. And, um, you know, I, one of the things we talked about with Nathan and uh, Mike was the use of uh, your social media apps and stuff that you already have in place that would help us immensely. And uh, not only from what we do, you guys would utilizing your your apps, we should be able to cover everybody. Yep, go ahead. Yeah, because I know I haven't seen any documentation, I guess, and that was my concern was when you do all the laterals going to uh, the service line, is it, do they got to pay fee? Is it automatic into their house? Is it hooked up to their house? And then from there, they would have to set up accounts with you to get the service being delivered to them? What's going to happen is uh, part of the grant is uh, the installation is free. It's part of the grant. So the cable that's being, the fiber that's being buried to the household right up to the first terminating box is all including in there. So that's all 
free. The only thing that you guys would have to pay for would be uh, the electronics. Uh, the wiring, the actual install in the house, all that's free. So um, you're looking at, I don't know, it depends on what you what kind of services you want. But yeah, the average is going to be like $75 for, for the electronics. So that's, that's all you're looking at. Gary? Yeah. Um, Jeff, you answered my one question about, uh, so the line is going to be buried to the house by use. And then say fifth line, for example, now that that's pretty well done, as far as I can see, I, you went down the whole road. So how long after that would would the customers be able to have the fiber to the house? Um, you're probably looking at probably another couple of months at least. Um, like I said, we're, we're starting up in Mohawk and uh, uh, first line. The, where our original starting point was, and then we'll we'll be down fifth line after that. Okay, thanks. Alina? I think it was you, Troy, that made mention of the big, big vehicles, how big these vehicles are. Um, my concern is a safety concern. I observed uh, you were down Seneca Road last last week. What are your hours that you're working? This time of year, we're typically, it would be around 8 to 8.30 when we start. And we're typically going maybe till 4. The summer months, we will really want to be on top of it and probably run 8 to 5, 8 to 6 if we can. Yeah, my concern yep. then is that that is a high traffic time for people getting their kids to school. Yep. So my observation was that there were probably eight vehicles on one side of the road spaced out, not in really any particular order. It seemed like there were people working and there was no traffic control happening. Right. Um, the weather was it was inclement weather and our our roads are sometimes narrow as it is. Yes. Um, so just for the safety of your employees and also children on the way to school um if you could make sure that the traffic control is out before people are working 100 well, percent, that should happen and we'll make sure our health and safety coordinator is out more to make Thank sure you. that's happening okay Gerald and cynthia yeah to you that was my other question too was on the same road was cars jotting in and out because your vehicles were separated so far and I know there's an MTO guideline. I don't know if there's 100 feet or 140 feet. You got to have two traffic people. So none of that was present. And your thing was stretched like three or 400 feet long. So, and buses were going by and they had to wait for cars coming. So it was just a just a little traffic jam on Seneca Road there. So, and that was, and I think I called public work just to make sure you, you got your traffic guys out there. So I don't know if they did or not. 100%. And there's challenges to the busier sections, obviously, fifth, fourth, Chiefs Wood. Those those areas, there's a lot of busier areas. Going down six lines, it's a lot. <laughs> you go into a dead end, right? So that's definitely something we've got to be on top of, and I'll make sure our crews and supervisors on top of that. Cynthia? A couple questions on the map. The green means the cable is put in, but the fiber has to be still. Put in is that correct? It's a conduit. It's in the on first line. It that green only goes for half a block. Is there some reason for that? I got all that another question. You can answer it together. Why is that? And does it need a con to work at the end of the day? Do we need a continuous circuit? Well, the, what happens here, especially in the Mohawk section, you're talking about first line, we have existing cable plant that's already there and it's above ground and where you're seeing where the green starts on first line there that's where we dip down or we we start go from aerial to buried and then uh, one of the stipulations with the grant was that they didn't allow us to overbuild and overbuild means that uh, anywhere that we have existing plant we can't 
we can't put in or they won't pay for or assist us in paying for um, replacing that. So all the, the grant is there for is to just new areas, new build. So some of the areas like um, are existing in the Schwiegen, um, Chiefswood, um, all of, right down the Tuscarora Road on Six Line, that's all um, has existing. So we're going to uh, utilize the above ground. So there'll be some places even after we're done, you won't see a like a loop there. What you're you're looking for in there, it's uh, it's going to be a combination of above ground and and below ground plant. So hopefully, I I answered your question. If you wanted, we could show that for them, right? Yeah, as, as well. we we can differentiate existing. that so it. At least you see that that's being done. Or right. So that whole piece in the center there, right from Six Line right down to uh, Medina, and then back over to where the Green Loop is, that's all existing cable plant. So that's already up and running on cable modems, like our existing system. So they already have access to decent internet. That would include the trail and uh, parts of third line, parts of uh, second line, and uh, very little on fifth line, just a little bit on fifth line. But that's our existing plant right now. Okay. So I don't see any other um, questions or comments. For sure, we can put that on our social media and get it out there. And especially with um, your numbers, I'm glad that your numbers are going to be there. Um, so can cut down on the calls. <laughs> you guys can have the calls. <laughs> yeah. So I'm glad to um, see that. Um, Leslie? Carolyn? Um, yep, just um, after Leslie, Melba. Hang on. Thank you. Hi, Jeff. And, Hi. and fellas, thanks for uh, coming here tonight. I, I was one of those people that stopped your vehicle one afternoon and said, hey, who are you? Why are you here in community? Why are you pulling in that lane? Like, why are you stopping there? Why are you sitting over here? The only reason I asked was because in that community you were in, was I knew it was all just, uh, seniors, vulnerable people, some, you know, a little bit, and some were disabled. So somebody said, well, we're, use that one word uh, about your fibers, right? Okay, so I understood that. But it was until they mentioned your name, Jeff, that I just went, okay. <laughs> right, like, okay. So maybe the signage on your vehicles, could say your company and your company because I'm not concerned about any government postings. I'm more concerned about that when they see First Nations, Six Nations, you know, like mm -hmm. your name, Jeff, put your name right out there and, and their name so that we know, so people don't get alarmed. Mm -hmm. And if they have problems, they'll know to contact you right away. They'll know where to send that call to. Well, they know where to call because we heard yeah. all of them. Okay. <laughs> but that was, that's, that was my take on that. Right. Like, it just uh, it was a van, but if the van would carry your logo, a magnet, just order it, throw it on, throw it on, like as long as it's you know legit. Okay, thanks. All right. uh, Melba. We lost her. <laughs> um, we lost Melba. So um, yeah, so just to let you know that we'll be able to put that on the our social media. And um, with your numbers and stuff, um, Audrey, I see your hand up. Yeah, just a suggestion on that that uh, map you have. Put a legend in there, so it'll be clear for the community to understand what your colors mean. It's up in the corner, it's pretty small though. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe you can put an ad in the paper and uh, make it as big as it needs to be to be seen. We will the increase. The more you communicate with the community and they ex understand what you're doing, the better. Yellow. Okay, thank you. So again, um, thank you for coming. Thank you for the update. And for sure, we'll get it out on our social media. I'm um, still work with Nathan, and um, we'll get that out. So thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Um, also, can Hello. I have her to exit? Oh, hang on a second. She's back. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, sorry about that. I got lost. I want to catch. I wanted to ask Troy and Jeff, do you have a training component attached to your business? 
We Solo has a very extensive training and safety policy. Um, it's it's very it's very large and like I can provide that our safety policy and uh, health and safety policies. We have a very extensive. One Is that, that what you're referring to, Melba? The safety. No, I'm not referring to that at all. I'm talking about a training component with the business that you are doing right now for possibly some of our people. Jobs. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, we have, uh, I mean, we, and, I don't know how to answer this thing there. We take resumes like everybody else. Um, our end of it is very um, complicated. It takes quite a bit of training to handle the fiber, to splice the fiber, to know what what goes where. And then a lot of it is uh, we can train, we run workshops, that type of thing, um, but it, a lot of it is just time, just um, hands-on kind of deal. And over a period of time is what it goes back to. But we have uh, eight, eight community members right now that from you know that are working for us and uh, uh, probably be ten or twelve by the time we're done with this. Okay, what about Troy? That's one of our most difficult things in business. We can buy equipment, we can get anything we want, but we can't get employees. So we are looking for resumes for applications all the time. So we are more than welcoming anybody to put resumes in. We're looking constantly to hire. Okay, with summer coming too, there'll be a lot of uh, young people looking for summer jobs. So hopefully you might be able to uh, accommodate some of them. Thanks. Looking for that. Maybe, okay. maybe we could approach uh, Great and uh, put that on their calendar and see if they're... Uh, you know, they can uh, pass people on to us type of deal, at least for the laboring. Yes. yes, thank you. Thank you, Melba. So again, thank you for coming. Okay. <laughs> um, can I have a mover to accept his information? Moved by Leslie, second by Elena. All in favor? Anybody opposed? Seen none. carried. Let's go to number five, adoption of general counsel minutes for January 9th. Is there a mover? Moved by Audrey, second by Dale. All in favor? Anybody opposed? See none, carried. Um, any council reports? Oh, geez, sorry. <laughs> oh, <wait. laughs> just breathe it. <laughs> um, sorry for that. If not, um, I'll just go to my updates from the chief's office. So, um, so there's the street hockey. So Parks and Rec, Recreation Department, is hosting a Play on Canada Street Hockey Festival on May 10th and 12th. This was approved at General Finance um, last August 2023. So again, there's going to be a Play on Canada Street Hockey Festival on May 10th and 12th of this year. Also, um, the my chief, uh, chief staff, um, chief's office staff attended a virtual meeting of Chiefs of Ontario Justice Sector, Sector on January 10th. The purpose of the meeting was to gain a thorough understanding of the work being done by Chiefs of Ontario regarding Bill C-53. Um, it was a strategic conversation we had and my office will keep the community updated of Chiefs of Ontario's next steps. Had a meeting with the Survivor Secretariat, um, introductory meeting with Laura Ardent, and she's a Secretariat lead at the Survivors Secretariat on um, January 16th. We, dis we discussed possible areas for future collaboration and the importance of recovery and revitalization. So again, um, as the relation develops, um, we'll keep the community uh, posted. Also, I was invited 
uh, to attend an announcement at La uh, Lansdowne Children's Treatment Center on Friday, January 12th. Uh, the announcement for the new funding secured in partnership with Ontario to build a new facility um, of La Lansdowne. The Chief's Office is working on setting up a meeting with Lansdowne to discuss the needs of Six Nations community. So I'm setting up a meeting with the director for that. So again, those are just my updates on that. Um, yep. Did they have a, in the meeting you had with the uh, Survivors Secretariat, uh, was there an opportunity to have any discussion of where they at? Where are they at up at um, the Woodland? There were. I've had questions come to me because they weren't aware of anything happening. They thought that part of what they were supposed to do was search for possible grave sites. Um, there wasn't too much of that, just an introductory um, worth um, what was happening, who's on the board, um, where things um, are at the Mohawk um, Institute, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't really much in depth, but hopefully our next uh, meeting, there will be. Mm -hmm. So that's all I have for the open. Is there a person to adjourn? Uh, Audrey? I have a question for you. <clears throat> um, when you talked about the first one about the street hockey and it was called Canada Roads should we be calling them our roads Six Nations Roads because they're not really Canada's they'll be playing on their own roads and yeah I'll adjourn it sorry about that I missed that one um, for sure we can look into that but I think that's what the grant um was called just um, Play On Canada Street Hockey Festival. Mm -hmm. But we'll look into that for you. And I forgot number eight, um, we have an update of the office of the CEO and then we'll adjourn. Do you have this presentation to go on? Give it up. And Nathan has um, an update. Thanks. Thanks, Chief. Um, while they're getting the presentation up, I'll invite uh, Zach and Holly up. They'll be helping you out with the presentation. Also, just want to note, um, uh, Trevor is on leave, uh, compassion leave. Um, just wanted to note that. Great mention. I didn't get updated today. It might be great mention today. Can you uh, put up the uh, CEO's presentation? It's in the Dropbox. So I just want to preference this might be a little bit of a long update only because it's been a few months and uh, they'll get tighter as we go. Um, but I'm envisioning to kind of do this for you guys once a month at the, the last general council. Um, but just wanted to start with the first slide. I know you guys have been working with Amy Lickers on a lot of the work around the portfolio schedule as well as the, the mandate. So just wanted to update that we did have an opportunity to talk with Sad about that, um, just so there is that kind of sharing of information back and forth. Um, in terms of the some of the pieces, um, there was, um, as Alan pointed out yesterday, beaten to it. So I'm cautiously optimistic about the portfolio system um, and uh, some of the SAT members did express some of those concerns around political and, and administrative. Um, further understanding on the mandates and how political mandates would be addressed in a timely manner was discussed. Um, really looking forward to the February 13th, 14th. And I know council will be um, defining a little bit more on those portfolio schedules. Um, but really started the conversation um, uh, as well uh, on a number of items. Uh, the one item I, I talked in particular with them about is the need to shift from the old kind of work plan uh, methodology and structure to a new implementation um, plan structure. 
uh, to include things like KPIs and performance management within their plans uh, within each of the departments. So a lot of those things we'll be working on um, at the senior administration level going forward. Next slide. As it relates to some of the pieces around the modernization, I know you guys had some uh, questions um, because of the last um, organizational chart. You needed a magnifying glass to kind of see it. So I've kind of broken this down into uh, so you guys can see some of the direct reports. So this highlights who reports directly to me. I'm not going to go through the list, but uh, in terms of some of those direct reports, they're highlighted here. Um, in addition to that, uh, just wanted to also note that uh, some of the new positions, I know there are questions about that. They've been highlighted here in parentheses, so you guys can see that um, going forward. Yes, Ellen? Oh, it would be nice if we had names to those titles. Okay, I can add those for sure. Because I have no idea who holds those titles. We can add that for sure. Next slide. Or do you want me to go through the names now? Okay. <laughs> so these highlight the direct reports for the executive directors. So you'll see uh, service excellence there. We have the well being, the community, which is a new position, um, and some of the kind of uh, areas that report into them in terms of the old structure to the new structure. Uh, as well as um, some of the new positions also identified here. So this kind of goes forward and we can add names to this as well um, going forward, um, just so you can see uh, where uh, some of the departments lie as it relates to the direct reports with uh, each of the executive directors. Uh, so we just wanted to provide this kind of slide so you guys could see and, and kind of correspond it. Cause like I said, I know the, the um, uh, the org chart was quite small in terms of being able to identify uh, some of these areas. Next slide. So this is a kind of the modernization of the future state. Um, I know we're going to be going forward and I'll, in the, in the future slides, I'll talk to you a bit about the, the kind of roll up because I know there was a cost analysis asked in terms of what this uh, modernization costs. So we're pulling that information together, but this is basically the uh, kind of a simpler uh, view chart of what the structure looks like with each of the uh, core services, as well as the operational departments included there with a little description on the executive leadership, as well as the senior leadership. Uh, so you guys can see uh, with a little bit more detail, I think um, uh, on, on the prior work, we had them all broken all, all into bubbles. Uh, but this chart actually shows the flow of uh, kind of the, the working relationship all the way through uh, between core services and operational services. Um, so this is, again, um, one of the things, uh, this isn't set in stone yet. Uh, one of the things we're doing is doing our evaluation and analysis of where we are. Uh, so we can bring this information back. And like I said, the cost analysis of, of what that uh, particular what these pieces cost going forward. Uh, Cynthia? Yeah, thanks for remembering that, Nathan. The, there's two parts to that equation. One is what is the cost? And equally important, if not more, is what is the source? And that is the ongoing, ongoing source for these funds. That could be identified as well. Thank you. Yes, we will definitely identify that. Next slide. So as part of that work, um, the other piece we're conducting is um, a number of SWOT analysis when each of these, uh, within each of these areas. Uh, so we can see the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats um, going forward. So you can see uh, not only from that, the breakdown of, of the, the costing, uh, but also the benefits as well as some of the areas of concern going forward. Um, one one area that we really saw in particular that we we want to focus on on a, on a priority basis because you hear about it through the complaints process you hear about it through uh, a number of uh, departments as well as my listening exercise around our outdated policies going forward and and lack thereof of procedures when the, within each of the departments so we've kind of highlighted that um, one to make sure that 
Um, organizational policies uh, are just that, organizational policies for policies across the board, but the departments have their proper procedures in place to follow those organizational policies. Uh, to to sure, just really to ensure that we're up to date and and more importantly in in compliance. Um, as you can see there, I've highlighted kind of health and housing as the priority areas that we're looking at. Uh, we know in the health field um, we're going through on accreditation rather quickly, so that's kind of a priority area. And through the complaints process, we're hearing uh, a number of areas of concern around the health policy pieces, which. Uh, I don't need to uh, go on further. We've we've talked about that quite a bit at council. Um, yesterday, I believe there was a question around training, and Holly does uh, have some resources that need to be expended. So we are looking at the public relations, some leadership training. We've already sent some of our uh, senior managers off to Mohawk College for leadership training. Uh, and also, we talked a bit about it, uh, but even including incident manage, uh, the incident management system training under the IMF on emergency management going forward. Uh, level one, we want to be able to uh, provide to all employees as they're coming in. It is a module system and it is free. But once you get into to the 200 to 400 levels, there is cost to that. So we're systematically looking at what we can afford and, and who should be a part of that. Uh, I would um, you know, respectfully request that some counselors take uh, the IMS training uh, at least up to level three, uh, four if possible. Um, so that's something we are looking at um, going forward. Uh, talked a bit about the, the cost analysis for the modernization plan to include the new system, apps, human resources, and other costs. And, and like you said, mentioned, uh, counselor, including the source and, and ongoing pieces within that. Um, also, now we got to figure out how to uh, take what we have uh, in terms of our organizational chart and make it a little bit more fluid uh, is how I'll say that so that you don't need a magnifying glass going forward on a lot of those pieces. Next slide. I have Audrey. Uh, yes, Nathan. Uh, I didn't see where education was. <clears throat> and there's several branches in education which need to be tied together and that needs to be discussed as well. Thank you. It definitely will look into uh, putting those pieces in there as well. Thanks, Audrey. My apologies for the typo. That should be listening at the top. Um, but this is the listening exercise uh, we're uh, looking to embark. Um, and I just put some pieces in there on the philosophy and the ethics of listening. Um, something uh, organizations tend to forget from time to time. Uh, but really, it's it's looking at from the standpoint of ethical listening is really the listening with an open mind and being able to hear the good, the bad, and the ugly. I think we're really good about listening to the bad and the ugly. Um, and I, I think we need to also emphasize all the good that we're doing uh, sitting on council as well. Uh, and strategic listening, uh, a lot of it's going to be on the team to really strategically look at taking the good, the bad, and the ugly and knowing how to use that information. And I'm really looking to Zach to kind of be able to compile a lot of the information that we're going to hear from staff, uh, also probably hear from the community, uh, and be able to kind of strategically uh, place that in, in a good way going forward so that we can incorporate uh, all of that input uh, in, a, in a timely manner, but also in an effective manner. So um, we are looking to embark. This, this isn't just a quick exercise. I'm proposing a six-day, eight-month uh, exercise, which really fits in for uh, the contract I have with you guys uh, to be able to complete this. And really this is gonna be based on and informed by the staff themselves through questionnaires. How do they want to be engaged? What topics do they want to be engaged on? And who do they want to be engaged uh, by uh, in a lot of ways? The goal is really, uh, the goal of this is really to put a process in place of better understanding the thoughts and feelings of the employees to create a better workplace. Um, you know, we really want to build that trust and improve the organization's communications in a very effective way. Um, Audrey, then Hazel. Uh, thanks, Nate, for that. Uh, just <clears throat> a couple of small things. I don't like the use of the word ugly. If you could find a different word for that, uh, uh, is challenging something. 
but it, I think it needs to re be replaced when we talk about our community like this and the conditions that are here and what we deal with and know how is it should be how to use the information under communication, last sentence. Yeah, probably. My apologies. <laughs> okay, you know, Hazel? Yes, Nate, I was just wondering, is it possible for us to all get uh, an organizational chart of each of the departments? I have found lately that uh, when somebody's talking to you, like, first of all, you don't even know who they are and where they are. And um, it would be very helpful to have a organizational chart that lays out all the different um, programs in each one of those departments and the names of the employees who, who are listed there. I, that is much uh, most helpful because a um, lot, lot of times it's like you're trying to guess, and I don't like guessing. So if you could do that, I'd sure appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Hazel. So that's something we're in the process of doing is kind of updating the organizational chart, but to also include um, the titles and, and the names um, going forward. So something we're working on and, and also in a consistent manner. So some of the ones I've seen a bit outdated. Uh, in terms of the departments, even some of the positions. So I just wanted to take the time to update those um, going forward. So big task because we exploded and I'm not sure the organizational charts were updated since 2017, 2018. Couldn't really tell, but um, that's something we we're doing on a priority basis for sure, Hazel. Okay, next slide. Um, what's Melba? Chief? Under the goals? Helen and Melba. Back to the goals? That one that had goals at the bottom? Brooke, can you just go to the previous thing? Yeah. Prevent employee turnover. We need to build trust and improve organizational communication. Like one of the things we have to look at is the way we advertise our jobs. I'm understanding that the jobs are being advertised through a, a um, really major international hiring place. I remember four years ago, some of the counselors want a council to expand their hiring process and start, they got they got administration to hire this international um, job posting. What do you call those things? Internet where you post jobs. It's international. It goes course. all over, goes over Europe, goes everywhere. That's where our jobs are being posted. And we're wondering why Six Nations community members don't seem to be getting in the mix. I heard one of the jobs, somebody post got, somebody applied from India. It's going everywhere. But be, the way we used to hire before was we'd do it locally. And then if we couldn't find anybody, then we'd send it out to the different reserves to see if it, you know, like spread it out. But internationally, that's why we have the United Nations working here, because that's the way we're advertising our jobs, and it should be community members. So if you want to prevent employee turnover or whatever it is to keep, I want people to come back to work for us. But if it's being advertised internationally, it's, it's hardly likely we're going to get a whole lot of people coming back to work for us. So that's my concern. We have to start looking at that. I don't, don't you, I don't know if you, uh, Hazel and Audrey remember, but that's what happened. They went from how we, they went from how we advertised normally, and then they started doing it internationally because they figured the, the counselors that wanted that figured, oh, we're going to get a really good mix of employees if we do it international because we have all kinds of good qualifications and. All that kinds of stuff. And and yeah, we get good people, but they're not from Six Nations. And yeah. we wanna we want people from Six Nations to be working for us. You'll be happy to know I don't use leaders international. So we we um since I've uh, gone on the position, I've asked the HR to advertise locally. Um 
if it does get to the point that we use leaders, there is a cost to that, and that's a cost I won't bear. So, Melba, then Cynthia. Yes, I wanted to ask and follow up on what Hazel mentioned about not knowing the staff and where they're located and what their jobs are. I think that's going to be very important, too, because when Darren was uh, in place, um, he certainly, we understand, had changed from director to manage managers. So hopefully that's clear on the chart that's coming forward. And also, um, one more thing, when Cynthia was in place, I believe she's the only one, she would give us a chart and information, I think it was on a monthly basis. Who's on leave? Now you mentioned today one person on leave. And then who was terminated? Who's the new employees? Those kind of things we really need to know. Because when we refer our community members, for example, they know more than us who is in place and what they do. Because they've already tried to get some services and they ask for certain people. So we need to get better at that communication and uh, understanding who our employees are, not only in council, but in the community. Thanks. Absolutely, Melbourne. My understanding is that information is intended to go to the internal systems committee, correct? Okay. So that's why I'll, I'll provide that information on a monthly basis. Cynthia? Yeah, I have a, a statement and a question as well. Um, the question is, do we, we when we post, and I'm glad to hear the jobs are being posted now locally first. When they're posted, do we stay down there somewhere that preference will be given to Six Nations members and other First Nations members? We, we used to do that. Yeah, and, and I think the criticism I heard is that it's a little small in the font, so we'll look to kind of increase that font size if that's the issue, but it is on all of the postings. And another part of that is that to make sure the screening tools the HR people use have that right in there. You, you know what I mean? Okay, and then a, a statement, my statement, um, you're saying you don't use leaders. I, I don't know if that's what um, Helen was referring to, that these things are posted internationally. They're a headhunting firm, and usually when you want your top people that you haven't been successful finding locally, not. But one, I don't know, they did, I don't know if they still do, is you or post with Indeed. That's a very challenging tool to use because that you do get applications from all over the world. And the sense I get, because you get a stack of them, is that uh, people coming to the country or already in the country are meeting certain requirements to get, I don't know if it's, um, whatever funding they might get from the government, they have to show that they've been doing these job searches. And most of the time they'll not even put out the um, full requirements, like a cover letter, resume, that sort of thing, just something. But that, that was, we just forbid anybody to use that. Yeah, I hear you on that for sure. And, um... One of the things I'm looking at is I think what's happening with Indeed is they're actually doing a search of our website and just posting on their own in some cases, which uh, I don't really like. So I'll follow up with that. Uh, I did see one instance um, that they did do that. Audrey? Yeah, just an, uh, another thing. I know that it's being done by great and that is resume writing and coaching of uh, our staff how to uh, do an interview and I think it should be offered to them verbally so then and also given the the uh, names of who can uh, provide it with great uh, phone number added or email and the more we help people feel comfortable being interviewed the better because then you get the real true person coming out in all their skills you know thanks for that that's good advice 
So this slide talks a bit about the um, support for political advocacy that I heard. Um, and one of the areas is just, we, we know at present, um, uh, everyone's like councils reaching out to the directors, senior managers for their supported kind of political advocacy. And I do appreciate, I'm, I'm kind of seeing, I'm being CC'd at least on, on these emails for this information request. Uh, but that's something well, once we kind of finish this process of the evaluation and and uh, some of the um, uh, the modernization as it kind of fills out, uh, we do want to kind of look at tightening that team up in terms of um, uh, getting support for you guys uh, so that you have your preparatory meeting supports as well as the data um, in each of your portfolios. So as, um, one of the areas I'm looking at is as you guys develop your portfolio systems, I'm trying to match, uh, and ensure that you guys got the technical support to be able to fill your duties within each of those areas. Amos. Um, are you going to have a, like a research component? Cause I've asked several times for the demographics of this community. Um, I don't know who's, who would go with that to make that request, but I think for us to do any future planning, we need to know what our population is about, from education to whatever. Um, so I don't know where we can place that right now, but I was just wondering whether we're gonna add that to our plate. Definitely wanted to kind of look at that and, and add that, uh, but really that's part of that cost analysis too, because once you get into those types of uh, research and, and really the, the census is, is really what we're looking at, right? Then the cost goes up. Uh, Zach, did you have anything further to add? Yeah, it's, it is challenging because a number of those sources are quite complex right now to gather a lot of it. We do have uh, general age demographics though through the Lands and Membership Office. And I believe their current listing is posted publicly on the SNGR website. Um, so if you go to the Lands and Membership Department page, they should have it within there as well too. If not, we can share it with council. Um, but yeah, it is like we're, my department's looking at doing a lot of that work still of gathering a lot of it because it lives all in different pockets right now. Also wanted to highlight the need um, going forward, and I think Helen's been asking for this, is once we get to some of these external uh, agencies like KU, AFN, ISC, we know some of our staff are on uh, some of these technical committees. Uh, so if we can get the agendas and motions uh, in advance, then we can better prepare and provide counselors with the technical briefings uh, so that they can be informed on Six Nations positions well before some of these matters hit the floor. So it's about getting that system together in place um, uh, going forward. Um, so that has been kind of identified as a gap of uh, the flow of that information. And that's something we wanna facilitate better in working with the chief's office. Um, and we are currently right now reviewing and making amendments to the briefing note structure. So council will have uh, more information readily available within the briefing note, most notably financial as well as sources of funding. Uh, in addition to that, what policy impacts uh, is, is their decision making um, having uh, going forward? So we are looking at those areas. Uh, next slide. Audrey? Yeah, are we also looking at uh, the Chiefs of Ontario? They asked if we could have a person, uh, counselor from Six Nations, to be on their, um, what is it, the resolution team which comes up before the chiefs meetings. And that way, that's one good way to get the information directly to chief and council and give us plenty of time to talk to it and also have the uh, tech technical people with us to work as a team to decide what our, our informed position is. So is that being done? Yeah, I'll check on that when I'm um, with Claire. Okay, thank you. Okay, as promised, um, this is my very, very, very preliminary, preliminary analysis of our legal representation, but it's led to kind of the following observations. Um, really, I'm seeing a lack of process for securing legal representation, uh, and this is mostly on the direction coming from council. Um, there's also, um, and I think I noted this with you guys, kind of a lack of clarity of the legal questions being asked. Uh, and whether even legal representation is required at that particular time. 
Um, uh, one instance I keep pulling out is uh, legal review of press releases, uh, something that might be alleviated if, if we had somebody on staff. Um, we also have multiple firms on file with various um, billing uh, requirements, with various um, fees. Uh, so, um, in these five firms covering uh, things like uh, hunting rights, the union certification, uh, the two or three class actions that we have, we have the defamation as well as the contract uh, disputes through housing. Um, so when I looked at the, the kind of five firms, it would, didn't really make much sense because we have a various kind of, uh, no, no one kind of sense of, of what those legal fees are and, and kind of tracking uh, a lot of those pieces. So something I want to really um, fix. Um, also, we're uh, some of the when I looked at the invoices, we're getting charged for wait times um, and, and having um, lawyers wait for hours uh, sometimes uh, while they wait their turn. So something I want to talk with um, the chief's office as well as work with Shirley to kind of make sure that, you know, we're not having our legal teams waiting and, and charging us for those um, going forward. Um, so possible solution is inviting general practice firms to submit proposals um, to be the firm of choice for all council related matters. An example of this I'll, I'll use is JFK Law, who is a boutique firm who has very reasonable fees, um, could submit a proposal to council to be the, the firm of choice on all matters so that at least we know going into it, we have one firm with the expertise, we know their billing, and we know how they bill on an hourly basis. Um, so that's something I wanna look into as a possible solution. Um, and, and just really kind of uh, dotting my I's and crossing my T's on that to see if that's actually viable. Um, so that's kind of the that particular piece, what I wanna see there. Next slide. Um, I know you guys talked a bit about the um, election code committee, and I know this is controversial at this point, but this is something uh, in terms of the next steps that we heard from the election code com committee that they were going to identify um, going forward and work with me on. Um, so the ad hoc committee, um, the, the purpose really of that committee now is to shift over and propose what those amendments are to the Six Nations Integrity Commission policies and procedures. Uh, so we know we have those in place. In doing so, the committee should proactively and comprehensively engage in the community to ensure that the proposed amendments reflect the concerns and issues uh, of the community um, concerning the elected council. So there is gonna be some outreach component to the work that they have. Um, it really it was the responsibility of the election code review committee to advertise and select the members of the community to serve on the integrity commission. So that was a change again in the election code uh, that was passed last election. Uh, a pool of at least 10 qualified members should be available uh, from which three commission members will be selected to review the election code. Um, and review the complaints as they are received. Uh, and it's also the responsibility of the election code review committee to receive the complaints. Uh, so um, there was kind of that particular piece uh, from the last presentation of the election code committee and motion that was passed uh, for me to kind of work with them on, on these matters. Uh, Cynthia Dale, Helen. Yeah, speaking of that uh, election code committee, I wonder if it's possible to um, have them go back out and, uh, I shouldn't say finish their task, maybe expand the task to which they were um, given a mandate. When I say that, it's in, of course, you probably all experience this during the um, campaigning for the election, the last election, almost without fail, people would ask, they were confused. They said, do we just vote for the councillors for our area or did it change? Is it all one big area, et cetera? And then I would explain the lay of the land, current lay of the land. But without fail, they all expressed a desire to have the districts. People were comfortable with that. 
they said, and when I was going around in my area, for example, they said, well, if we got an issue or concern, we're going to call you because we know who you are. And that likely holds true for the whole of the community. So maybe of that, they could be put to that task again. I didn't even see it on, you know, they had the um, um, suggested changes. I didn't even see it on there, as a matter of fact, which I found surprising given the feedback I got. And the other one was the um, the educational requirement. This was pointed out to me, nowhere else is that a requirement. Those were just a couple suggestions. And if that, if council is in agreement and doable, you might add like other things for them to, to go forth and ask the community what's their um, feeling on it. I guess, however they went about their, their work to determine what finally everybody voted on i don't know but those things were lacking i noted that i'm passed that on dale yeah in regards to this election code committee i guess and the new election that was voted on i have some serious concerns what did transpire and then going through the election i don't remember this the last point there of the election code committee replacing themselves in lieu of the uh, chief electoral polling officer so I got some serious concerns with that, with the people who were running the uh, new election code vote that this, I guess, I, I don't know if it was actually voted on or if it was a, a line item to be voted on, but in the end, I guess it's in the code that the election code review committee receives a complaint now, which was the chief electoral polling officer. And all she did was gather the information and send it on to the integrity commission, which was the purpose of the integrity commission to say yes this is a, a valid complaint and here's here's the results of it or no it's not a valid complaint but now i see here we have the election review committee or election code review committee reviewing it to say yay or nay before it goes to the integrity commission so what's the sense in having an integrity commission so i i see i have some serious concerns with what transpired and i don't remember that particular point be a, a voting issue in regards to the election code. So uh, I'm, not, I, I, I'm not, I got some concerns with that process that was established because even the chief electoral polling officer, all she did was accept the, he or she accepted the information, the packages, okay, integrity commission, do your job. That was their role. But now we got the election code review committee doing their job of the integrity commission. So I got concerns with that. Helen, the name is... Yeah, I have a lot of concerns with that too because uh, the election code review committee redesigned the integrity commission and then appointed themselves as the elect part of the commission. They can't do that. But that's you can't design something and then appoint yourself to deliver it, so to speak. And that's what they've done. Um, and I agree with Cynthia too. I, I got, I heard a lot of people, they want districts. They don't want grade 12 because there's so many people, older people that never went to high school. Um, but none of those questions were even asked on the election code review committee. But yeah, I have a real concern. And then my other concern too is privacy. You're going to have what, three people on the election code review committee looking at your complaint, and then you're going to have the people sitting on the integrity commission looking at your complaint? I mean, they have half the reserve looking at your complaint. It's a privacy issue, I think. And can the election code review committee do this on their own? Because I thought that I didn't know some that the integrity commission was really connected to the electing code, but I guess it is. But they never took this to the community to redesign the the uh, integrity commission, and I think they should have done that. But that wasn't part of the questions on the voting thing. So I have concerns. There's a lot of privacy issues, and I just can't. I just don't think people that designed the program can turn around and put themselves to run it. Amos, then Dale. 
In most jurisdictions, though, the election committee isn't a part of the government. It's separate. If you look at most jurisdictions, it's not a part of, we shouldn't be a part of us. And we have to ask the community if they want it to be a, a standing committee of council or not at arm's length. I think that's the first questions that should have been asked. And the integrity committee usually isn't a part of the, of the election code. It's a separate standalone committee because it, it, it can question us, our integrity as elected officials. That's what it should be about. So it has to be arm's length. I can't be paying somebody off to go, oh, don't say that because I don't want you to say that to me about me in public. You know, that's what can happen, right? It can be very, very dangerous. So I think we need to go back and maybe re, re examine that and make sure that it has an integrity <laughs> that it doesn't, that, that we can't influence it as an election official. Anyway, that's my comment so far. Dale? Yeah, I mean, just my understanding of an ad hoc committee. An ad hoc committee is given a task and a focus. Once that's done, they're dissolved. But as you can see here, it's not. They've become, from my election code ad hoc committee, they become the election code review committee. So as, and taking all those comments into account too, I'll bring back as much information as I possibly can in, in terms of what I have, because um, like I said, motions were passed and I'm just following along. Um, going forward. Next slide. Um, wanted to talk to you a bit about space um, because um, we are looking at a number of avenues uh, to increase um, office space uh, across the territory while we also look at the last point there, the, the design and, and new builds. But just wanted to give you guys an update um, that we have um, been in discussions with Six Nations Polytech on um, roughly about 1,500 square feet um, at their um, facilities on Henry Street. Um, and uh, they do have a first and second floor available. Um, so that's one thing we're looking at uh, as uh, we go forward um, in terms of that office space would be give us about 15 offices and kind of earmarked for um, Zach's uh, team around policy, performance, and evaluation. In addition to that, I did meet uh, with uh, Heather George about some space uh, available at Woodland. So we all know they've done the renovations and there is office space, um, a, a little bit of office space available, but more office space uh, looking to become available as they um, have their potential new build going forward. Uh, so I've signaled to them uh, an interest of a possible partnership down the road. Uh, I do have it on uh, and been having discussions with some of the leaseholders over at Eagle's Nest. Um, uh, there is uh, the potential of uh, a majority of that becoming available uh, and also used. Um, we could utilize that for future office space. So I'm just going to continue to kind of go through that. I uh, already talked to you guys a bit about the plaza, and, and we are looking at the potential use uh, for some of those current leasees who are just kind of using it for tax purposes uh, to maybe open up some of those offices so that our uh, some of our departments can utilize that. Um, there is a long-term plan, and I'm, I'm looking at the, I kind of dusted off a plan that I found uh, about Oneida Business Park and exploring some, off, uh, some uh, possible new buildings there. Uh, commercial and office use for that particular area. Uh, and uh, again, we've talked about uh, our, our archival library and, and records building uh, design. Uh, asked Mike to kind of do a, an update to that. Uh, and that was a site we were looking at um, uh, up to about 50,000 square feet um, uh, for that kind of a facility going forward. So that's the work kind of I'm, I'm undertaking on that side. Next slide. Cynthia. Okay. So I updated quickly the other day about the union certification. They have withdrawn, QP has withdrawn uh, on that aspect of things. Uh, so um, that's not an issue um, going forward that we don't really have much, um, much to worry about there. Next slide. 
Uh, and this was in Zach's kind of, or sorry, Trevor's area. Um, and this kind of highlights some of his work that he's been going forward, uh, in continuing to support some of the various meetings as it relates to the proponents uh, for um, the CAP team uh, and attending meetings uh, with them. Uh, Eric Caucus, you, you guys know he's the technical support on a number of tables there and continues to kind of uh, help circulate the draft agendas as well as documents for uh, those particular areas uh, in support of um, that aspect. Uh, next slide. Helen? He's got visited, uh, what did it say? Municipal municipalities and visited proponents and municipalities. What does he say to them? Do you know? That's part of the cap team process. So he's within the cap team doing that. Oh, so he just talks about us or yeah. like our community or whatever the alderman traffic is. One of the things, um, just the kind of piece, and we know this is going to kind of come up in April, is the community engagement standards. That's within Trevor's kind of uh, wheelhouse. So he is working with departments on what that means, as well as some costing along that. Uh, we talked a bit about the GA Treaty Border uh, Alliance and uh, got an update yesterday from Lori on that. Uh, Lori is part of his team. Um, he also supports a lot of, in absence of the um, environmental task force, he is providing the leadership um, in absence of that particular committee right now. Uh, and that's a lot of work. And uh, Chief knows she used to be on this, uh, on the drainage committee, um, as well as um, uh, EF, the environmental task force and, and any other leadership meetings there. Um, he still continues to provide uh, supervision and, and guidance to uh, Joe uh, uh, in terms of the, the program, We Hear the Matters. Uh, and as we all know, that's quite a busy kind of area um, going forward. Uh, he is, again, supporting the TAC team on, on some of the meetings with the Chief's Office relating to the City of Brantford um, and also assisting uh, supporting with lands and membership, lands and resources, Mother Earth, justice, and tourism on an ongoing basis. Uh, from here, I'll just turn it back over to Holly and Zach to finish off. And like I said, I know this one's long, but it's been four months, so I just wanted to be as comprehensive. We'll tighten this up as we go. Okay, if we want to go to the next slide. Okay, so what I've done, just some high-level overview of some of the work um, we're currently engaged with, uh, with planning performance and evaluation. So one of the first pieces with this is that the uh, it's it's been known sort of as a portfolio that I oversee. Um, it's unique in that, uh, to my other EDs, in that I don't oversee current departments that are already in operation. This has been a lot of work that has had to grow sort of from the ground up. Um, but as the teams have grown, as we've identified more and more gaps that need to be addressed on the data end of things, um, we've, we're moving in the direction of those teams becoming an official department. Um, at that same stance, we're also looking to rename it from planning performance and evaluation to data analytics and foresight, um, to more clearly identify the work that we're doing. Um, because is tied to that right now, planning performance and evaluation doesn't really speak to the data work, and that's primarily what we do. Um, so I just I want to explain a bit around that. So the idea of data, which I, I explained during the orientation for you all, um, that's just looking at the various sets of information that we have across the organization and within the community um, so that we can be more strategic uh, within our planning and decision making. Uh, the analytical end of it, uh, this sets us apart in our data work. Um, it was a trend that I saw in feedback from my staff as well, too, as a, as a potential new name, uh, as well as aligns this broad, better with the broader industry uh, within this field as well. And then that final term of foresight. Uh, so this emphasizes the strategic use of our data, developing ways to forecast and plan using our data, and ensuring we are always looking towards the future in our planning for those uh, phases yet to come, as we say within community. Uh, 
number of senior managers, um, a number of my senior managers are continuing to connect with their department, other department leads to build up those data sets. Again, we are, um, the organization is in all sorts of different sort of uh, development levels of how they use and collect data. So uh, my senior managers are going out to help support uh, within that, both in strategic manners, but also analytical as well. Uh, we are continuing to keep aware of the broader data governance matters as they impact the organization and community, and we'll bring that up to council uh, as applicable as well. Did you want me to go through the slider, Audrey, first? Um, go ahead, Audrey. You're on mute. Sorry, I had to do it once this, this meeting. Um, a suggestion for foresight that that be changed to something like strategic planning, that sort of stuff that it is even more definitive of what, you, of what you do. Foresight into what, you know? But if you say strategic planning, that's why you're doing all this analysis so we can make better decisions for the future. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for the feedback. Um, we can definitely consider that as we look to finalize the name. Uh, where was the next point here? Um, we're continuing to identify external revenue sources to support our work as well, too, so we don't have to be as reliant on administrative fees or other departments to support uh, within this work. Um, as mentioned earlier, we're looking at office rental space for the teams uh, so that my staff can do more in-person collaboration. Um, we have some community engagement items that are going to be coming up soon. I'll get through that once I get to updates around the specific teams themselves. Uh, and then, as Nathan mentioned earlier, um, we're going to be looking at developing some key performance indicators uh, for the various departments uh, in the year ahead. Uh, next slide. So community data and analytics, this is where a lot of our both service data for the organization and also our community data uh, is stored. Uh, a lot of our more health specific data lives with the epidemiology team, as you can see below. Um, so the senior manager is uh, continuing to connect with a number of different uh, directors and other senior managers within the organization, again, to help them with their process around uh, gathering that service data, ensuring that we can analyze it correctly. Um, and all of this data that is collected, I, I do want to emphasize, is non-identifiable. Um, so we make sure that we follow best practice around that as well, too. Um, it's purely uh, the numbers that we see on our end. Continue to work as well too on processes and policies. It's been a bit of a gap as well within the organization that we've identified. So we're currently working with the policy uh, department on that. Uh, continue to build out this team uh, as more and more sort of areas are needed within the data. We continue to identify that more staff are needed to help in this work. Um, so we are going to be posting a couple new positions uh, within the weeks ahead as well too that community can keep their eyes out for. And then I, my portfolio, this department that we're developing is in collaboration with uh, Service Excellence, which is what Holly oversees around the Building Safer Communities Fund. Um, that work is designed looking at ways of prevention within guns and gang violence within community. So we're leading the data portion of that work. And then uh, people on Holly's end are doing other work sort of tied in with that as well, too. Within the epidemiology team, so they're continuing to build out that community health profile. Uh, I know Councillor Amos has spoken to that a few times. Um, there's a number of different data sources tied to that as well, too. Um, they're monitoring uh, infectious disease within the community, chronic conditions, uh, environmental health matters, as well as uh, prioritizing any sort of community public safety issues. And some of that can be tied to uh, overdoses or other matters that might be needed to make community aware of quite quickly. So a lot of that comes first to the epidemiology team and then is sent out through communications. We also recently developed a monthly epidemiological report um, through this team, which is uh, used as an info source for various leaders uh, across the organization for service planning and ensuring that we can be more proactive in the work that we do. And then finally, within this team, uh, and this is one of those community engagement pieces, is uh, we are going to be launching in March of this year, uh, March 9th, I believe it is, is what's called the Ongwe Hongwe Health Check-In, and that's led by our community health survey team. And essentially what this is going to be is our first ever large-scale community health survey. Um, 
We've never done something on this scale before, but this will be really helpful for us to understand more clearly what the health needs are within community so that we can better uh, design and plan our services to meet those needs. Um, again, as well as to make us more proactive uh, within our approaches within the service planning aspects as well. Uh, Leslie? Hi, Zach. Hey. Okay, uh, you talk about epidemiology and infections and different things here. And then you talk about data, 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 data. Yeah. Where is the data stored? And is it, do we own that data or does it, you say they? And I know you, some of it is meaning it's going out into the, to the different various uh, people that are u utilizing it. Yeah. yeah. Like here. But do we own that data or is that data sent any further from here, like to Ottawa somewhere? I mean, mm -hmm. I just. Any data that belongs to the community is owned by the community, is meant to be used within the community. That doesn't necessarily mean that all data sources are, um, that we necessarily have access to at all times. And that's also a lot of the work of my team is trying to identify what are those external data sources and then reaching out and having conversations with those individuals so that we can ensure we get that data back. Um, there is a lot of movement around that, even within sort of the broader First Nations Indigenous space tied to data where our data is being used without our knowledge and we're trying to ensure that that's not taking place. Um, and I guess I would just say further to that, there is a lot of sort of strategic thinking and planning that needs to be done. Uh, and that might be better in a more specific meeting with council to do some of that work as well too. Okay. Just on the more political ends of things. Yeah. Uh, next slide. And this will be my last slide for my update. So the planning team, uh, you have met some of these staff already too, especially those who are part of the last council. This is uh, currently a number of these members are our health planning team. Um, so they're looking at that work of health transformation and how we can make it more applicable to the community itself and not trying to uh, simply follow what's mandated uh, to us. So they're continuing to engage with the community around their thoughts of the future of our health services. So again, there's a lot of crossover between uh, this work as well as the work that Holly does within service excellence, working with various stakeholders to define what our health service delivery model can look like for the future. Uh, we are assisting the health department where needed on various uh, system analysis projects, as well as this team is exploring ways to tie in more of our cultural practices and values into the delivery uh, of our services as well too. So again, trying to ensure that uh, culture is foundation in all the work that we do. And then finally, the research coordination team. Uh, so this team is continuing to support our research ethics committee in reviewing and approving research studies that take place in the community. And then they're also finally being able to meet the gap of actively monitoring approved research studies as well too. Uh, as some of you know, some of the past processes for approval of research studies, they would go through the ethics committee, they would come here, there would be approval, but then there wasn't a lot, always a lot of follow-up with those research studies. So now we have a team that's dedicated to do that follow-up and to really monitor them and ensure that any of the data from those studies, again, as applicable, um, comes back for benefit of community. So I'll provide a further update that on that as well too in a separate council meeting. And that's my sections. Move this, I guess. All right. <clears throat> Thanks, Zach. So just a quick overview of the service excellence portfolio. Um, so some of the work that I've been involved in uh, since my time, uh, just over a year with the organization, has been taking a look at the organization as a whole in terms of uh, services and operations. And that's essentially what service excellence is meant to do, is to ensure that uh, the operations um, or being facilitated and conducted in um, a high quality manner and in a manner that is um, the most efficient and most effective for the community. And so part of that work has involved doing an analysis of the organization, taking a look at um, the various operations, uh, the various processes that are happening across the organization and understanding where um, some of those uh, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats lie. 
and really identifying where the gaps are and um, identifying some plans in terms of meeting those gaps and uh, ensuring that the service departments have everything that they need, all the resources that they need in order to, to do their jobs in the most um, efficient and effective way. And part of part of my job as well is, is providing that uh, feedback to the CEO um, who would then update uh, chief and counsel around what the findings are, what we're seeing sort of across the organization and some crossover with uh, Zach's team with planning performance and evaluation is um, how do how do we collect that data? How do we engage with community as well in terms of the surveys and understanding from community uh, what their experience is um, of the different programs and services that we're offering? Um, part of my role has also been to take a look uh, at our leadership structure as well. Um, and part of that, part of my role has been to um, develop and update uh, key job descriptions for uh, leadership positions um, for the director of community and the director of well-being. And both of those folks have been um, hired and, and onboarded and have been a, a very um, integral part of the work moving forward in, in a really short period of time. Um, these folks have been part of the organization since early December. Um, and have really hit the ground running in terms of um, looking at the landscape of their departments, um, also participating in that analysis and that review of, of their um, portfolios, and really identifying um, some metrics and plans in order to um, move forward in, in, a, in a good way. And I know we've, we've mentioned modernization uh, previously in this presentation, but that's something that we're also looking at um, across the various departments as well. There's modernization that needs to happen um, in terms of well-being, in terms of the community as well, community department. And so uh, part of that work is uh, supporting that and kind of developing plans strategically on how we're going to move forward. Um, we also have the Professional Practice Office, which is part of uh, the Service Excellence Portfolio as well. And that office was created as a result of some of that initial analysis in terms of understanding where the gaps in the organization were. And that was really identified as a, a lack of standard and professional processes and guidelines. And so the Professional Practice Office is really... Um, going to be key moving forward in supporting um, the various departments in identifying and standardizing uh, professional practice, uh, clinical standards, um, as well as our policy review and development moving forward. Um, <clears throat> strategic planning and visioning, that's another uh, um, project, I guess you could say, that uh, I'm working on with the various directors and really uh, clarifying and defining the service profiles. So really trying to understand what is each program and service offering? How do you access it? What is the objective of that? And so that will help us to develop some performance uh, measures in order to um, track what, how we're doing and to be able to evaluate those services. And over time, we can see um, once we have those metrics developed, we can actually track them and see if we're improving or if we're, you know, how that's, so that's kind of how Zach and I work together in uh, developing those uh, KPIs. Um, next slide. And <clears throat> So yeah, essentially in my position, it's it's having a bit of a, a bird's eye view on what is happening across the organization. And that's, um, I've been really been able to step into that role now that the directors of well-being and directors of community have started in their positions, which has been um, really, really uh, incredible to have them on board, as well as the senior manager of professional practice office. And so we're at a stage now where we're really starting to kind of 
plan strategically what our next steps are and to be able to work together. Um, so it's all starting to kind of come into fruition along with uh, Zach's team. And we're really looking at standardizing processes and procedures across the departments and moving away from that siloed approach. I know that's something that we've talked about as well as um, the organization just, it, it grew really exponentially and really quickly. And in order to keep up, folks were kind of developing practices and procedures in order to kind of keep up with the, the speed of the growth. And so it's really looking at across departments, what are we doing? And can, is there a way that we can do that in a consistent and standardized way? So that's looking at our administrative processes, financial, human resources, um, leadership, uh, communication is a huge one. Um, it's really important internally that we have a strategy in order, in order to um, understand how is it that we're ensuring that the staff members are informed and aware of what the changes are, as well as the community. Um, policies uh, is another huge one. We're uh, looking at developing some plans to review and update those and recruit, uh, recruitment and retention as well. So I know that was mentioned around um, uh, preventing turnover, um, attracting Six Nations community members to the organization. Um, so that's all part of uh, the strategies as well. Next slide. Um, so I've highlighted projects that I've been overseeing and, and working on. Um, a lot of my work is, is very much at this point project based because um, there's a lot of complexities in terms of, you know, what the gaps are. It's not one area. It's, it's uh, you kind of, there's a lot of things to consider. And so um, what has helped me in this work is really kind of organizing various uh um, projects to help uh, keep things on track. And so um, along with the Director of Wellbeing, we're leading uh, the review of uh, Iroquois Lodge um, and we'll be able to provide update um, around that at a later date. Um, addiction medicine services is another area that uh, I'm exploring with the wellbeing team. Um, and it's something that I understand it's a it's a need in, in the community and we need to understand uh, the best practices and also uh, do some engagement to understand what that's going to look like moving forward. And then the modernization of well-being. Uh, there's a there's a ton of work that's going on here, uh, currently being led by the director of well-being, uh, Deb Jonathan. And we're really taking a look at the um, well-being as a whole and doing that service excellence uh, um, approach to that department. So again, it's it's taking a, a review and analysis of that department as a whole, understanding where the gaps are, um, understanding which policies need to be updated and, and reviewed, um, establishing uh, clinical uh, practices and, and pathways, and um, really just, again, that communication strategy. Um, how are we engaging with the staff? How are we ensuring that they have what they need to do their job in the best way? Um, and then just evaluation and also uh, that community engagement. Next slide, please. Um, that's a similar process that's gonna be happening with uh, the D Department of Community. So currently they oversee Ontario Works as well as Parks and Recreation. And so it's gonna be a similar process that uh, the Director of Community is, is taking on as well. And it's really doing that analysis of those programs, um, looking at exploring uh, revenue generating streams, um, looking at all the resources, conducting those uh, SWOT analysis and gaps analysis so that we can really uh, be proactive in managing any sort of risks and also just um, uh, collaborating on our strengths and identifying what those look like. Um, financial management and oversight. So I currently am overseeing the Building, uh, building Safer Communities Fund, which is uh, public safety funding, which is meant to um, 
look at addressing and reducing gun and gang violence. And I think that's a very uh, timely uh, fund and, and work that needs to be done there. And currently working with Zach's team to start developing uh, the project plan for what that's going to look like. We also have uh, <clears throat> social emergency management funds, which uh, we're looking at um, establishing some training for staff around emergency management. So that was the IMS training that uh, Nathan was referencing earlier. And then another project that uh, I'm working on with the professional practice office is looking at developing internal emergency response codes for um, the organization. And that will involve updating policies, procedures, as well as staff training in the event that there's a, an emergency within uh, Six Nations offices or buildings or facilities in terms of medical um, evacuation, that sort of thing. Um, so that's all part of that uh, social emergency fund work as well. And I believe that's it. Audrey. Yeah, and thank you for the presentation. They were both well done. I just wanted to know, are you, are you also um, uh, keeping track of the list of all the things that are working well at council and all the programs so that people don't, they feel good because what they, they've helped create. And if things need to be tweaked or changed, then they, there's a better understanding there you know, of the rationale. You know, yeah, yeah. So is there? Okay. I, I know you guys shook your head, but <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see that. That's what I thought. <laughs> no, I can't hear. Hello. Hello. Oh, oh, sorry. So part of our process as well in, in doing that evaluation work is to to show where we've been and where we've uh, gone. And part of that in order to demonstrate that and paint that picture, we need to start collecting data and tracking it over time to be able to, to demonstrate that. And that's where those metrics and indicators um, are really important to uh, identify and to start uh, putting practices in place to be able to track that over time. So when we have that, we can also, that helps to demonstrate what's working well um, and not just where our gaps are. Yeah, okay, yeah. Melba. Melba? Oh, finally. I don't know what's happening, but I wanted to mention uh, uh, rental situations. And I mentioned before <clears throat> that we have the building where the Cannabis Commission is in, and there's huge spaces in there, I understand. And I'm questioning why it's not being renovated. Uh, when you have... Uh, offices outside the community uh, in some cases as we know our people don't always have a vehicle so it'll it'll cause a little problem at times with some of our members so if we could do some rental right on the reserve if we could that would be great for our people thank you yeah thanks melba i did have one of the slides where we we're looking at those exact rentals in the plaza um, they are uh, existing leases um, within those, but we're having discussions with uh, with those individuals uh, to see about utilizing Great. those. Things. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your guys' report. Uh, can I have a mover to accept this information? Moved by Leslie, second by Elena. All in favor? Anybody opposed? Seen uncarried. Good question. Are we going to be able to see a copy of this? For our own in a Dropbox, is there not? Um, he'll get the updated names to you, <laughs> and that'll be in your Dropbox also. So again, uh, go ahead, Dale. Yeah, just a comment in regards to I guess this, I guess sort of the status of everything at. So and just to reinforce what Cynthia was saying in regards to, and I guess that's something Nathan will be bringing forward. Is uh, I know we've created a serious um, or multiple levels here of bureaucracy within Six Nations, and and again, long term, like where's the source funding for all of this? And hopefully, it's just not with internally with within Six Nations from OFNLP with dollars, 
because right now I, I see us looking like um, an upside down pyramid right now. We keep going down this road. So the justification and the funding for it, then I guess that's something this council needs to, to review and ensure that everything's in place so that this upside down pyramid gets the right way up. Yes, for sure. Um, Cynthia? Yeah, maybe um, Nathan, hopefully you, you emphasize with your team as they're going out and have an interface with uh, different staff and supervisors, managers, directors, whomever, they're explaining thoroughly what they're about. Because one of the concerning things we're understanding is previous, but working towards this um, new regime or whatever we're calling it, people were left in the dark, very much left in the dark. And it was like the KBG was working out there because everything was so darn secretive. Nobody knew anything. That That's just not good. It's very, very, very negative. It's not a way to approach any kind of development. You keep people involved and in knowing the rationale right from the beginning, right to the, the lowest levels of all the different workers. Then they're aware of what's going on. They know what the rationale is. They're involved and involved in the decision-making along the way. Then there's buy-in because at least this is our the insight that we've been given so far is that hadn't been happening. And then that's, it seems why a lot of people were very resistant. Yeah, thanks for those comments. And that's something we're very mindful of going forward. And, and in fact, um, have been spending a lot of time uh, my own time doing one-on-ones um, to to kind of hear those concerns as well and, and address those, but also now um, looking at it from the standpoint of also, and it's important for me to kind of emphasize this is the analysis has to happen as well. Um, to 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 Dale's point around the um, uh, the the rationale, uh, so that's something. Um, while we're doing that rationale, we're also doing the effective communication out um, to. Um, all staff, really, frontline, uh, as well as um, senior managers. So thanks for that. And I think also do, just from the presentation is also just bringing the community along and what's happening. And I think that's the most important also. So again, um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. That ends our open agenda. Uh, so have a great night, everyone. Thank you for joining us.